Oh hi, I'm the Heretic. Just to recap, the history of civilization is a progression of cycles that repeat every 80 years called the Seculum. The Seculum has four periods, the High, the Awakening, the Unraveling, and the Crisis of Civilization leading into another High. Each of these four periods, these turnings, occur roughly every 20 years and always in sequence. The cycles are driven by generational archetypes born during certain turnings and acting unwittingly according to their life stage, displaying characteristics consistent with other generations of that archetype. Children born during a first turning will act like children born during a first turning 80 years ago, and so on and so forth. Through understanding the fourth turning, we learn where society is, give context for what's happening today, as well as infer the future. If you haven't seen my previous videos on the fourth turning or need a review, go watch them right now. Don't worry, I'll still be here when you're done. Anyways, on to part three. We'll look at where we are on the seculum. If you were paying attention in part two or were watching the end of a few of my other videos, the answer should be obvious. As of 2018, we're in a fourth turning, silly. You'll recall, a fourth turning is the crisis. The great societal question that shakes the very foundations of society as civilization moves through a great historical gateway. These are legendary times of great struggle whose consequences reverberate throughout the culture for decades to come. But don't take my word for it. According to Wikipedia and my counting, there's 278 World War II video games, World War II being a previous fourth turning. World War I has 47 video games, 78 Vietnam War games, and just to put this all in perspective, there's probably 116 Star Wars video games. So yeah, pretty culturally impactful. Take a look at this Tower of Books. It's a 34 foot tall tower of every biography of Hero of the Civil War fourth turning Abraham Lincoln. It's 34 feet tall. 8 feet in circumference at the Ford's Theater Center for Education and Leadership in Washington, D.C. That's a lot of biographies. Suffice to say, kinda important culturally. This is where we are now. We're coming up on the 80th anniversary of World War II in a few years, so the timing is perfect. But a fourth turning is itself also divided into four parts. The stages of which society recognizes the problem, unites in common cause, tackles the problem, and bathes in the afterglow of triumph or the sting of defeat. Unlike the turnings, there's no rough estimate of how long each stage should last, but just like the annual seasons and the secular seasons, come they must, and so they will, in order. The first stage is the catalyst, a singular spark of history that challenges the status quo and demonstrates the fault lines of society. This is initiated by an event, a titular catalyst, that wakes people up from the indulgence of the unraveling and exposes the inability and impotence of civic institutions against this rising threat, both perceived and actual. How these catalysts, these sparks of history manifest, are wide and varied. It could be as serious as a mass tax revolt or major sudden ecological degradation. It could be as inconvenient as an economic downturn, or even as mundane as an election or a tea party. It could even be a series of small events, each unrelated, but all pointing inexorably towards the weakness of civil institutions and existential vulnerability of society. No matter how grand or simple, once so ignited, the catalyst sparks a conflagration that drives society irrecoverably into the next stage of the fourth turning. The second stage is the regeneracy. As the faults of the order are made undeniable, society demands institutional answers to existential problems. The institutions will be found wanting, or worse, part of the problem. Thus, will society tear down the establishment and coagulate around the new order. The splinter and fringe groups formed in the third turning unraveling fall into obscurity as deviation against the new order becomes socially unacceptable, life congealing into new civic life. Like a phoenix to the flame, 
institutional power re-energizes in response to the catalyst and mobilizes society against the perceived threat. Here's some examples. In the Revolutionary War, the Boston Tea Party in 1773 catalyzed the Revolutionary War crisis, the regeneracy of which wouldn't occur until the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1775. In the awkward American Civil War seculum, the crisis was catalyzed by the election of Abraham Lincoln in November 1960. America's regeneracy began on July 1861 at the First Battle of Bull Run nine months later. Black Tuesday in 1929 would kick off the twin crises of the Great Depression and World War II, and regeneracy would begin with FDR's election in 1932. Interesting, an election can be both a catalyzing and regenerating event. After social institutions regain their strength, society moves as a singular unit in the climax of the crisis with full force and clear purpose. It's a period of maximum conflict when societies act with maximum effort and are fought to unambiguous conclusions with clear and obvious winners and losers. When the climax begins, it should be obvious. The American Revolution, the Civil War, and World War II, the fighting all occurred over the course of their respective fourth turning's climax. When the group-minded civic generation born during the third turning are marshaled off into war by the idealistic screw-up generation born during the first turning, once the battles are fought and the surrenders are made, the great engine of society's war machine is shut off. Soldiers come home, society begins rebuilding, war production is turned to peacetime production, borders are redrawn, treasuries recalculated, historians begin the arduous task of figuring out what the hell just happened. Victors are rewarded, and losers are punished. As the spoils of war are shared, society answers the questions that drove the crisis in the first place. Thus, does the fourth turning move from a climax to a resolution. V.E. and V.J. Day, the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in Yorktown, all of these began the end of the crisis with clarity and resolution. As society reconfigures for peacetime and great lessons of the past crisis are learned. As civic life had been re-energized in the regeneracy, the populace moves forward with high trust in civic institutions and a belief that anything is achievable. After all, if they went through that war, then what couldn't they do? After the rebuilding begins, society moves past its crisis. The old seculum concludes, and a new seculum, with a new first turning, a new high, begins. Now what role do the generations take? Well, the screw-up generation are the politically powerful elders whose idealism and narcissism, unchecked by elders, drive society towards moral absolutes, with confrontation being the inexorable conclusion, seeking decisive conclusions with no ambiguity. The pariah generation are in midlife, the pragmatic problem solvers who provide the competency and expertise that turn the elder screw-up grand designs into practical action. Team-oriented civics take it upon themselves to achieve civil solutions to societal problems as young adults. Conformists are born into a sheltered childhood at a time of crisis and are encouraged to keep their heads down while grown-ups take the big work of protecting society. As the archetypal order takers, the civics being in the prime of their physical fitness ensures they are the effective workers and soldiers to the screw-up elders, thus ensuring maximum intergenerational cooperation while pariahs provide the practical expertise that keeps the wheel of society turning to protect their conformist children. Just to be clear, who is who today is like this. Baby boomers are the screw-ups, Gen X are the pariahs, millennials are the civics, and Gen Z are the conformists. So let's take this back home. Where are we right now? Well, I already said we're in a fourth turning, but where specifically? We're definitely not in a climax or resolution, so that narrows it down. While the 2008 financial crash should have catalyzed the crisis, the government spent $700 billion in bailouts to postpone the crisis and stabilize the situation, temporarily. They didn't avert the danger, they just kicked the can down the road with a pre-catalyst event, you could call it. 
No group, yet, has taken the reins of the regeneracy. Both sides of identity politics, the SJWs as well as the alt-right are trying to position themselves as the regeneracy. If they were, they're acting exactly how they should, especially social justice warriors who demand conformity and strict adherence to moral doctrines. Interestingly, SJWs have high institutional power in establishment firms such as government and big tech companies like Facebook and YouTube who regularly screen for racist or sexist content and numerous EU countries fine, arrest, and jail people for hate speech. However, whether or not they actually are a regeneracy or simply a remnant of old institutional power remains to be seen. While these groups don't have popular support now, that could change. But what about Trump? Well, Lincoln, Washington, and Roosevelt weren't the cause for their regeneracy, but usually the figureheads of them. It's difficult to say that a regeneracy has begun or not. Franklin Roosevelt was heavily criticized in his time for all the right reasons, as was Lincoln. And you can bet that there were loyalists during the American Revolution who supported Great Britain. Roughly 20% of colonists, in fact. Now, the 2016 election of Donald Trump might have sparked a regeneracy, but we'll only know in hindsight. We have not even finished the catalyst stage yet. Well, I can personally think of several existential crises to our society, the state, Islam, communism, etc. None have presented themselves that society would mobilize to stop them. Now, what will a catalyst be? The imminent murder of Tommy Robinson, yet another casualty of the UK's rapacious lust to become airstrip one from George Orwell's 1984? Russia retaliating when the U.S. once again launches an airstrike for the jihadis in Syria under yet another obviously faked false flag chemical attack? The dollar crashes after China's petro yuan sends the petrodollar into an inflationary death spiral? Anything could happen. Now one other thing people should keep in mind, different civilizations experience the four turnings at different times. Russia, for example, is currently in its second turning, the awakening, if the revival of the Russian Orthodox Church in the last few years is anything to go by, and if we can conclude the fall of the Soviet Union was a fourth turning crisis. Make no mistake, Europe is in a fourth turning too. World War II has synced the secular clocks of the US and Europe. Whatever happens, it will affect the whole of Europe and North America. Look, we've been here before at each other's throats. We'll get through it, and we'll be fine. You don't think family members in the 1850s agonized over slavery or American independence in the 1770s? Of course they did. As do we, today, on an issue that will be answered in the end. In the Revolutionary War seculum, it was American independence and the viability of constitutional republicanism as a form of statist imposition of societal organization. In the Civil War, the question was slavery and state sovereignty, the result of which cemented federal supremacy and the ethical unacceptability of slavery. In the World War II seculum, national authoritarianism was trounced by international authoritarianism. If the horrors of the last 80 years were any indication, the World War II seculum did not end positively. Though to be fair, there wasn't any possible good outcome. What issue will be solved this time? Statism? Islam? Race? Who can say? For those living at, say, the Revolutionary War times, what the issue was and how it's answered would have been hard to foresee, probably. We only know now, with the benefit of hindsight. Twenty years from now, the issue will not only have been clarified, but its cause and the confrontation that characterizes this crisis will have seemed obvious and inevitable. If the petrodollar collapses and crypto becomes the new medium of exchange, as people revalue their assets once the dollar becomes worthless, the fourth turning will expose the impossibility and irrationality of status involvement in finance, or even answer the question of the state entirely. That's one possible outcome of this fourth turning, but one can hope. As tempting as it is to want all of this to end as quickly as possible, I would caution. If we rush the progression of the fourth turning, we risk having a lot of bloodshed and brutality compressed into a very short amount of time. We saw this with the American Civil War, the bloodiest conflict in American history. So I guess that's all I have to say for right now. In part 4, 
I'm going to look towards the future, offering my thoughts and practical steps for you to take, as well as what to expect for the next coming seculum. I'll leave you with this. You know how awful baby boomers are? Yeah, they're the worst. Well, bad news. The children born after our current fourth turning is over into the next first turning, they'll be of the same generational archetype as the baby boomers. So basically, children born between 2030 and 2050 will be baby boomers. So yeah, if you want to have children, well, it's 2018 now, so you have 12 years. Otherwise, your children will be the worst again. Questions? Comments? Critique? What are your plans for surviving this crisis? Don't know I have a Discord server? By all means, hop on. I'm pretty active there and I'd love to see you. Link in the description. Support me by donating to my Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.